that you know. It's called Reading Beyond Boundaries. It's part of a series of events that run throughout the whole festival um, called Border Crossings, where we're looking at, we're thinking about that term border crossings in every possible sense. So sometimes that means political borders, borders between countries, borders between different identities, classes, genders, sexualities. In this case, what we're looking at uh, is how literary influence crosses borders because every writer is influenced by every writer that they've ever read and no one becomes a writer without reading a great deal. Uh, so every writer, it's a kind of a standard question at literary events for a writer to talk about their influences, the people who have influenced their work. So what we've done is, in partnership with the British Council, who I'd like to thank for their support, we've commissioned three writers to do pieces um, which range in form from, um, from sort of more uh, uh, essay type pieces to, to poetry which reflect on uh, a particular writer who has been an influence on them. What I'll do is I'll introduce everyone at the beginning so we can keep things flowing pretty smoothly. So first we're going to hear from Ariel John um, who is uh, the writer that, that she is going to be discussing or sharing uh, the influence of is Pablo, Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet. Next we're going to hear from Barbara Lala who is going to tell us how her most recent novel uh, grounds for tenure was influenced by her lifelong obsession with Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, the Middle English author. Finally, we're going to hear from Shivani Ramlochan, who told me years ago that uh, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca was the first poet she read that made her feel understand what poetry was, and she's going to tell us a bit about that experience. After them, we've got a guest reader of sorts, um, Anu Lakan, who has recently published the chapbook Letters to K. K in the title is Franz Kafka, or is it? <laughs> Maybe it's not entirely clear if the K that the letters are addressed to is a historical Kafka or a character who's been invented by the author. So we're going to hear readings from, um, we're going to hear the commissioned pieces by those three writers, then a, a selection from Anu's letters from K, and then assuming we have any time left, we're going to have a bit of a conversation and there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So let's welcome the writers and let's get straight into it. Hi, good morning, everyone. Oh, well, midday. Afternoon, it's afternoon. Perfect, thank you. All right, so I'll jump straight into it. I have a series of poems. They all kind of flow into each other, so I will read it as such. I fail Form 6 Spanish, the lowest grade in the literature section each of the after-lunch lulls of in-class siestas finally paying off, where I really thought I could spark notes my way through Gabriel Garcia Marquez's No One Writes to the Colonel. Because what is war to a grande girl or to corrected by a tongue school, finding out her womanness in the world? Two Sundays before, when the hard hat worksite manager tells her to call her father if she really had questions about the cell tower being mounted behind her house without approval. Call the same father who sprouts a fist full of tumors grenading, grenading beneath his skull on threat of blindness five years later. And Garcia's characters do not have names. And I learned that by 17, that being a woman is also not having a name in many people's books. My father's tumor condition is also so rare that it has no name in the diagnosis. The cell tower is still there. We lose the house on account of my father's medical bills. I fail Form 6 Spanish because I fall asleep, because Garcia's work does not meet me in this way of being a woman. He is writing on corruption and cockfights and all the other causes of death. I am too busy trying to find ways of living here where I do not have enough of a name to mark my own gravestone with. What we remember of the dead is perhaps all that they live for. We get put here to put others on their course and in that vein, my uncle told me that to read a poem out loud, I am free to make all the mistakes I need because they are mine. And all of me is worth my owning mistakes too. He bought me my first collection of Neruda's work and everything after that 
is the forgiveness I keep giving to myself. My friend of a decade who calls my parents on their birthday, who drops me back home at the wayward hours with the slur of the fat slugged on my tongue and the reckless jokes then flung from it, the kind of friend who messages me before a performance and after and sometimes during, the friend that brings me gluten-free, dairy-free, dark chocolate, that is friend to have. And I jump on a plane and move to London and did not text her to say that I was leaving. I mean, she didn't know that I was flying out that month, but two days later, on my cousin's couch in Peckham, is a series of messages of the cussed out variety, without any kind of obscene language, because she still wouldn't talk to me like that, says that she admires how well I detach from people, say that is a barely human, say that that is, a, is barely a human way to live, say how I remind her of her ex, and Neruda's book is the only one I have traveled with to a country dominated by gray and the work of being alone. My father is also upset with me because he did not get to see me off at the airport as is family custom. This time, I hear plain big woman and let the man I just secretly signed marriage papers for take me to the departure gate through which even our union does not make it to the other side. Neruda is coaching me through the days of crying headaches, a chilly end of summer, and low cash. The book is called Extravagaria, translating to the action of wandering about without control. And here in the West African section, southeast of the city, I think about losing my address to my momentum, the freedom of swimming past every post of settle and stay. Neruda says, goodbye friends who loved me. I go singing across seas and I go back to breathe my roots. My city is geography. The street is called, I go, the number not to return. Here I learned that Neruda's friends used to love him, but it becomes a task over time. Someone shifting in and out of space so fast, nothing is there to hold affection in place. It is as though Neruda's heart doesn't even stay inside his body, full of its own dreaming, its own will to give and grow and maybe under some other wind somewhere away. For everything that I used to pack in my suitcase, for everything that I refused to pack in my suitcase, there, was a, there is always my heart and that blue book, and beneath my blouse a collection of people who have given in love, in laughter, in love make, in lessons, in blessings. I stay wanting to go again, and if I don't come back, it have WhatsApp and IG and email for that. This final poem um, comes with a bit of a trigger warning for rape and sexual violence. The man who I find in a new country, who I have new hopes of marrying after never having returned to the man before him, visits my bedroom for the first time sees Neruda's collection on the wooden desk next to the other well-worn things, like my green, st green tea-stained coffee mug, a half-burnt lavender candle, the left chamber of my heart. He picks it up and asks, you know he was an abuser, right? I walk over and wonder which man could he possibly be talking about, some drunk character in the book probably, or somebody from an earlier conversation we had. But nah, not Neruda. Not the only book I hauled over all that water, all them continents, all those seasons, and women's marches, and therapy sessions, all them interventions with students I mentor, all them chats with survivors, all that self-talk in the mirror. But in a 40-year-old memoir, Neruda talks about his maid, quote, one morning, I decided to go for it all, grabbed her forcibly by the wrist and looked her in the face. There was, there was no language I could speak to her. 
no había idioma alguno en que pudiera hablarle. She allowed herself to be led by me, unsmiling, and soon was naked upon my bed. The encounter was like that of a man and a statue. She kept her eyes open throughout unmoved. She was right to have contempt for me." End quote. There is no language I could speak back to my friend. No había idioma alguno en que pudiera hablarle. And there is one last line where he says, No se repetió la experiencia, the experience was not repeated. And in this confession of fault, it is both the sunken ocean of my stomach, drained of everything that makes it, and a meditation of all my own mistakes. I become yet another statue, woman without name, glaring at the book cover, and even there, Neruda knows how we are right for having contempt for him, his dead self, and all the other men who are not, who are still here with us, looking us in the face and deciding on how much of nothing we must be. Thank you. Thank you, Bocas, for having me. So I'm going to talk about Chaucer and me. When I was an undergraduate, the English special at UE Mona included Middle English and Old English or Anglo-Saxon and English language history. <clears throat> and I chose to do an extra year of Anglo-Saxon. Of course, almost everyone asked why, so not relevant. And that was why an other world beckoned me and I was curious. Only that remote space resounded with oddly familiar echoes. Cultural interface was already at work in Anglo-Saxon verse that strains to recapture vanishing past, snatching at disconnected memories that flash and fade. Then, after centuries of Germanic epic and elegy, violent cultural collision with Norman French effects a break in transmission. Beyond the cataclysm rises quite another literature, a different language structure with a transformed vocabulary, along with a new poetics. When I wandered into the medieval landscape, Middle English literature turned out to be in a contact language of no standing, neither learned nor elite. English was the language of the street. Like Caribbean post-colonial literature, Middle English verse was performed in the face of more privileged governing literature. Late medieval verse, verse mimicked perpetuated, ridiculed, revered, and resisted the discourse that had been legitimized by the court in Anglo-French or sanctified by scholar or cleric in Latin. 13th to 14th century verse projected the aftermath of colonization, exile, and alienation. Narratives wrote back to and rewrote tales from classical canons, even replanting them in an island setting where a chivalrous Orfeo, rather than Greek Orpheus, journeys in search of his wife, carried off to another world. And then Chaucer, who fuses pilgrimage with carnival. Chaucer chooses English instead of a prestige language, and so vernacularizes intellectual and spiritual reality. And from all walks of life, Chaucer calls on speakers, many of whom would never have had voice before and sets them up in conversation and argument with each other. Chaucer projects a multivocal version of humanity. My doctoral thesis tracked the figure of Moore's death, not only interrupting life but shadowing humanity from the inside, mortality as the spiritual and therefore to the medieval real state of abduction, loss and exile already built in. Only they're cut across the macabre and its tolling Timor Mortis, the resilience of Chaucer. April showers dispelling drought, a journey in celebration of healing. Pilgrims from Afrishira's end, the holy blissful martyr for to sake, that him hath holpen when that thy were sick. So there was Chaucer on his transcultural frontier against a deep past of repression and trauma, 
crunching the gulf of time and space between us, as well as gaps in the social class, gender, and learning of his characters. He hailed me out from his other island, where he engaged in forging a literary voice in a colloquial language. All this pestered me into writing uh, post-colonialisms, a Caribbean rereading of medieval English discourse. But all the time, my other self went on writing fiction. And I came to my fourth novel, Grounds for Tenure. This was on college life in the Caribbean, where brilliant young scholars can dangle indefinitely on the periphery of their world, open to subtle and sometimes flagrant exploitation, because there are just too few posts to go around. So I felt again a cool breath from the medieval. Life was insecure. Something uncanny and uncontainable, death, the Green Knight, the King of Fairy, or a headhunter could abruptly just break in and transport you to another world. <clears throat> Morgan Shade was lying in wait for her in the car park when she left her evening class at the Learning Resource Center. She could not possibly have known what he was with his brisk, all-inclusive grin, except that the flash of teeth remained fixed a few seconds longer than need be and did not light the deep-set eyes in his somewhat hollow face. In dark no-name jeans with a black t-shirt and worn shoulder bag, he bore no reassuring mark that might encourage her to talk to him, unless it was supposed to be the carefully preserved accent of a man educated in Britain decades before. But a few warmed over diphthongs were not enough to win around Candice. Having materialized from behind a traveler's palm and edged up to her car under the low trees that dripped rain water and fine sodden yellow flowers, he slid his card across the worn bonnet of her foreign used Toyota with the stern gesture of one serving a supina, while somewhat irrelevantly bearing another swift cold grin. I've been authorized to seek out appropriate persons, he said, and to invite them to apply for truly attractive positions in tertiary learning that are about to open up. Hypersensitized by Chaucer to the multiple meanings of fellowship, I found myself exploring in Grounds for Tenure ways in which ideals of academia might be confronted by class of values. There would be those there for what they could get by any means possible, including brass face sweeping up of other people's intellectual property. The sort of thing UE staves off through its ponderous but well-intentioned bureaucracy. The sort of thing to which less wary and unaccreditable institutions easily fall prey. My scholar, a bit like Chaucer's Clark, interfaces with a teller of tales and some truly superior minds, but is also besieged by intellectual ne'er-do-wells. And all over again, I got swept up and borne away, then borne back home by Chaucer's pardoner's tale. Pilgrimages were carnivalesque in those days for the church to frown on. Chaucer's pilgrims agree to entertain themselves by exchanging tales, and along the way they don and doff their masquerades. One of the pilgrims is Chaucer the narrator, distinct from Chaucer the author and not our brightest bulb. <laughs> another is the raunchy miller, another a fast and many husbanded wife, another a scholar like the clerk, and so on. One is a partner, a scamp who sells rubbish as relics, as well as pardons for sins committed, by permission of the Pope, he says, so factor in a pun on bull. The greedy pardoner tells the three revelers, in a time of plague, as Chaucer's was, who, takes offense at the de who they take offense at the death of a friend and undertake a quest to kill death. An old man they address rudely, bad sign, directs them up a crooked way to a tree under which they will find death. They find a pile of gold, which they lay claim to and swear to share, but they determine to cut each other out, literally. And here is gold, and that full great plenty, that shall departed be among us three. But nevertheless, if he can sharp that so, that it departed were between us two, had he not done a friendless turn to thee? Besides the blade through the side, Bread and poisoned wine are shared out in a corrupt communion. 
all three strewn dead around the tree. Anything can happen any time. Good thing the, pilgrim is, the pilgrims have a partner along to keep their souls prepared for death, here and especially hereafter. So says the partner towards the conclusion of his robber talk. Chaucer's partner's tale is a yarn of audacious greed and outrageous corruption in a time of plague to die for. So, through some naughty tampering with a couple strands of it, Grounds for Tenure teases out types of exploitative personal and professional relationships that can spring up and flourish in barren ground. The medievalist narrator of my tale unfolds possible outcomes when the world of real academia, in all its intangible wealth, confronts some concrete but disintegrating mass of charlatanism. With what I confess to be a sort of unholy glee because Chaucer's laughter is so catching, my novel contemplates this unstable ground of greed and waywardness in academic settings against a context of pestilential intellectual fraud. As she saw it, the progress of the three colleagues must have amounted to a fellowship fraught by subtle but corrosive conflicts of interest. And it seemed now, as Candice mentally reviewed what she had heard, that the three together had been searching for different things, one for love of a sort, one for money, and one for unlimited sexual opportunity. The fraternity had gone sour at exactly that point when their interests converged on the road to professional advancement. Each had declared a common interest in the Unstable Skins project an interest that was genuine but secondary to the private greed in which each was absorbed and which each fed like an addiction. They were not at one, after all. Once Francine and Courtney and Sack found themselves with a common goal, nothing was left but to destroy each other so as to keep the whole mess quiet and get exclusive control of the publication. Much of my work happened, at least in part, because along my way, I fell into the company of a court poet who six and a half centuries ago chose the common tongue and so inscribed the ordinary voice, nativized the imagination, reached for communal insight, unsilenced the female consciousness, and disclosed the personhood of the poor. So had he spoken with him, everyone, that he was of her fellowship anon. Thank you. There is a reference to the British consul in this brief preface to the poem. It's not flattering, but it's very distinct from the British council <laughs> who have generously funded this project. <laughs> Federico Garcia Lorca animates the spirit the bold facity and the intent of so many of my poems. Lorca was my first poetic touchstone and my first example of what a life lived in and for the political service of poetry looked like, executed by Spanish nationalist forces in 1936. Lorca's body has never been found though many have searched for it. And while I do often think of the bones of Lorca, I am more interested in the duende that animates his work, the work of so many other writers I prize and respect. Duende is near undefinable, almost something you feel and must feel rather than attempt to explain. You will know it in work when you find it. It will come for you and grab you by the throat with a kind of intent and significance as ancient and eldritch as the very first bloodied hand on the very first cave wall. There is no living without Duende once you have discovered it. There is only the desperate, feverish need to play in it, serve it, and live by it until you die. Preciosa y el aire is the poem of Lorca's I return to the most. It was the first poem I ever wrote by hand in my notebooks multiple times, in Spanish and in English, 
for pleasure and for pain, which is also its own pleasure. In it, a young woman runs for refuge to the British consul, where an Englishman gives her a glass of milk that she drinks and a glass of gin that she does not. This is a vivid, alert poem, so full of duende that it seeps and aches. When I was younger, I thought it was a romance. Now, I know that it is not, but I wanted to present a romance in response to its terror. What if Preciosa ran to a space less populated with riflemen in black capes? What if she ran right to the arms of her beloved on a Hindu wedding Matikur night? The dark poet whispers in my ear that you're coming to the Matikur. Instantly, the cock I don't have grows hard. Instantly, the mouth I use to pray and sin fills with blood. When I find you, you are already undulating to Tassa by the water pipe the pythons of your black plaits mischieving the midnight. When I put my arm around your waist, troubling your sari, testing your piety, the dark poet murmurs encouragements and dangers. Preciosa, here is where I want you, unhidden by the wedding moon, Fat as a secret bride spilling with stolen fruit. Hair is where I press you, sticky and segmented into the flanks of a Julie mango, into the garden ground of my mouth. Hair is where I have brought you to flail, to fight, to writhe, to die on my tongue, or else live forever. The dark poet warns me that there is nowhere the eyes of the tribunal men won't find us, Preciosa. We dance as though death is coming for us, as though the tremble of an execution waits in the noose of my brown arms around your brown neck, your brown nose bridging my brown nose, wetting sweat on my brow and between my breasts as I work closer to the lit dear of you the last flambeau on the coastal road of you, the hot cutlass goldening in the village sun of you, the rippling robust certainty of you, your skin polished with the 2019 years of your survival. We whine and flex in a sargasso of tanties and nenens, their floral house dresses bunching at the junctions of their hips and the buttresses of their asses, their white lace or knees falling over cheek and teat, their gold teeth disco lighting the maticour when they throw head back and laugh, a collective grinning serpent, a gathering of good women who are afraid to get on bad. The dark poet perched on the streetlight knows all their names, hoards them in the underworld of his palate to whisper me each one, his voice treacling with joy. Indrawati, Mahade, Kalauti, Sushmila, Rukmin, Rajande, Nandini, Kausilia. This is how we join our names to theirs, Preciosa, in sweat and in secrecy, in prayers, and in lies wet with ghee, and anointed in black till, blaze us together in an Agni Kund, bless us together under the nocturnal eyes of the dark poet, whose ceremonies are love. We are married with this gyration. We wed in the swell of the orthodox, then turn it onto its hennaed belly to sign our names in its filigreed underside. We are the opposite to everything the pundits have imagined. 
the antidote to their poison leaks from our interlocked thighs. Kashmati, Senkauri, Samdi, the night petals around us like a Sirius, revealing Chandini, Pulbasya, Jayanti. The night pleats us into our own brown arms and we move into it as trusting as birth. I have always carried the dark poet inside me, the eradicator of shames, the clear-eyed gospeler of temples, the ransacker of fear. I have eaten the hot stones of the dark poet's path. I have dwelled too long like a confessor lurking in the dark poet's bower. I have slit the throat of every self-censure I once embroidered disgorging it from the root to cut its throat and gargle its blood. Preciosa, I confess what you must have always known, from womb to tomb to unsealed pit, that I have been the dark poet adoring you. Miracle, it's at the right height. Um, first, thank you to the commission writers for so generously giving me a space here. And it seemed, uh, I want to start with an answer. Yes, K is for Kafka. Don't imagine that it's anybody else. I don't have a good enough imagination for that. Um, and it strikes me that it's the right place uh, to read this simply because he really has no business being here. This is a forum for commissioned writers who were given a specific brief and it would be just like him to end up exactly where he had really no relevance. Um, so I'm going to read the first three letters from my very few letters to Kay. Dear Madam, we are in receipt of your letter of June 2008. Regrettably, we are unable to provide any assistance that would allow you to initiate correspondence with Er Dr. Kafka. Since, in your letter to us, it appears that the notion of his demise is not unfamiliar to you, perhaps our response has been anticipated and will not prove too great a disappointment. We hope this will not curtail your enjoyment of his writing, or the works of any other writers, living or deceased, who we have the privilege to represent. Best regards. Dear Herr Kafka, thank you for your timely death. If you were alive, I am quite sure I wouldn't have the courage to write to you. I am equally sure I would not have your real address, since publishers have a reputation for withholding such information. In your case, the quest would have been especially problematic since your publishers are somewhat stupid. To what I considered a polite and necessary letter, asking them if they thought you would be amenable to my communication, I received the idiotic response meant, as far as I can tell, to make sure I continue to buy your books. So here I am, rather illogically, writing to ask if I may write to you in the future. Clearly ridiculous, since I'm already writing to you. Also ridiculous, since I can expect no evidence of acceptance or refusal. All the same, it seems only good manners. I live in an indelicate time when people take great liberties in addressing strangers. We give no thought as to the desire of the other party to be so afflicted. I am not yet sure what will help me to decide if I may continue to write, but I do want to so very, very much. Thank you for your attention. Best regards, JL. Dear Herr Kafka, I don't, I don't go in for signs 
or astrological forecasts or things like that. So I can't wait for any such guidance on whether or not it would be acceptable to write to you. Yesterday, however, while visiting my parents, I saw a scrap of paper as it wafted down from the hall table and it said, Franz called, said he'd call back. No indication as to who it was for. I am not aware of any friends of my parents of that name, but my ignorance in this matter does not make the existence of the note any less real. Since all I have is a very arbitrary set of personal rules of interpretation, which as a matter of course, I apply very arbitrarily, then this is all the counsel I can expect, my own, fed on less than nothing. I've decided to write to you. Things, as things are wont to do, are likely to take a different turn. That is to say, I am likely to think otherwise for no clear reason. But while I have it in mind, I thought you might like to know some of the things I was hoping we could discuss. Well, not discuss exactly, but you know what I mean? So I said to myself, I said, self, think about this. You have not chosen to write to someone you know personally not someone you can possibly meet. You have not even opted for an easy-going dead person. What are you going to say to him? What do you want to know? So I've made a list, and here is a bit of what I want to say. One, I understand. Two, I do not understand. Three, you must have been beautiful because everything you said was true. Four, I too am tired and often unwell. Five, the world is squalid. Six, thank you for being born before me and writing it all so I need not feel so alone now. Seven, I'm angry you were not born closer to my time so that I need not feel so alone so often. Eight, I'm sure you had beautiful hands. Nine, did you play the piano at all? 10. You had such a bad habit of getting engaged. If you'd been with me, I'd have discouraged that kind of behavior. Maybe eventually we could have moved in together, never with any talk of marriage. Sometimes that's what does a person in, the idea of that one last step. If you ignore the step entirely and move straight into the gentle, intimate, comforting domesticity, maybe you'd be okay. 11. Would I have been willing to live in a very cold place for you? 12. Maybe in getting to know each other, we would have come to accept that we are so fundamentally lonely that not even the presence of the other could change it. There might have been some comfort in such an understanding. 13. I doubt we would have had similar taste in furniture. <laughs> I'm very keen to start talking about the furniture. Best regards, JL. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much again to these four writers. Please, let's give them another round of applause to thank them for their, their words and their readings. Um, and, you know, four very different pieces of writing influenced by four very different writers. Um, and the first thing that strikes me, um, it's, it's almost kind of immediately um, obvious and sort of almost the elephant in the room, is that we've got four women writers and for some reason, the writer that you influence by, that you've chosen to tell us about, they're, they're four male writers. Um, so that, that makes me think that, you know, very often writers say that, you know, they, very often as readers and as, as writers who are readers, we're looking for stories that resemble us, that tell us who we are, that are told by people who look like us, sound like us, are from the same place as us. It's very important, you know, to be able to see in literature the world that you live in and people like you and the people immediately around you. But obviously it's equally important in, in a book to be able to find people who are nothing like you, places that are nothing like you, times that are very far distant from you. Um, I thought maybe I'd start by just asking all of you to talk about uh, just that fact that you know, you've been so influenced by people who, by writers who are completely different to you and whether you've ever found these, these influences to be, to be inconvenient to be awkward, to be almost offensive to yourself. I think maybe I'd, I'd ask Ariel to start because your, uh, your poem immediately addressed that, that topic of you know, being a, a, adoring and being influenced by a writer who you then discover something quite horrible about. 
Yeah, sure. And I think um, in that vein, that's why I chose to start with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, because my first encounter with that particular writer was in you know, the context of Cape CXE, of Cape, um, sorry, literature, and um, Spanish literature. And for me, it was kind of making that contrast between that writer and Neruda, finding a kind of hyper-masculinity that existed in, in, in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's work that wasn't necessarily the case with Neruda. So Neruda tended to have this fixation with the ocean and with just like a kind of slowness of time. And for me, um, there's a lot of feminine essence within Neruda's work that I could not locate in previous like Spanish literature um, that I would have covered. So for me, that, that closeness to Neruda's work had to do with, uh, yeah, yeah, that feminine essence. And do you still read him? Yeah, I do. Um, his work is still, he's still an amazing writer in my book. Um, but what I've been juggling with, as I imagine, as a woman in this space, you often have to do is like, how do you make that distinction between the person and their work? And what are the limits there? Like, what are your personal limits with how much you could engage and what you engage with? and how you then decide to make sense of their work in your life and its, inf its impact and influence in your life. That's a kind of a dilemma that's, that's come up several times across the course of the festival. I think maybe most um, prominently in the, um, the, the event on Friday about the, the Naipaul inheritance, the fact that this is a writer who we, we, many of us acknowledge as a great and indispensable writer who also was in many ways a damaged human being we wouldn't necessarily want as a friend. Yeah. And in that, in that sense, um, I attempted to end with my own reflection. Like I think in some ways we are all damaged human beings. And um, how is it that we are allowed to just kind of heal from that trauma that, I mean, being a post-colonial person in the Caribbean is a place of being damaged, is a place of being troubled. Um, so how are we not managing to not pass that trauma on generationally? And how are we able to, yeah, develop that, that amount of healing both in the work um, as writers and within ourselves as people? Barbara, I suspect that you and Chaucer would have been very good friends. <laughs> Well, I want, maybe I want to ask you to reflect on that a little bit because, I mean, your, your affection for, for his work and for the, the, post, the persona that, that he portrays in his work and, for, and your, your understanding of your, your, your sympathy for the position he finds himself in, that was obvious in, in the piece that you read. But maybe what do you think you would have made of Chaucer the man? And, and in all these years of reading Chaucer and, and you know, writing about Chaucer and teaching Chaucer, what are the... Are there, is there anything that you found that, that's, that's sort of troubled you or that's made you have to sort of step back or to kind of... Yes, of course, um, because it's, it's a very conflicted time and the, what he produces is, is, is very Jane has faced. I mean, he's, he's very much a man of his time, existing in um, certain established um, and for the most part unquestioned situation, social hierarchy, and so on. What interests, I mean, well, before I go to that, the, it's always ambivalent to what extent he is reinforcing the established positions and to what extent he is resisting them. It remains completely ambivalent to the end. What I thought extraordinary, what I think is extraordinary, is that he can ask the question at all. Um, in, in, a, in a framework in which people think of such of questions um, of people's place, women's place, um, uh, gen, gender ambivalence and so on, all of these things. The fact that he remains ambiguous instead of coming out and hammering the established position on the head is one of the things that interests me. And a lot of things remain ambivalent about him too. There's a much... Um, there's been a much discussed question of whether he was actually guilty of rape. Um, and that would not in any way uh, um, allow me to befriend him. But the question is, what is rape? The point is that raptus in those days could also have meant abduction. And some people say no. They think he held a, the man's daughter um, away from him so that he could claim on a bill that the man was not paying. Now, I'm not saying that's pretty, but it isn't rape, but it would still be raptus. It was just, the, the word was in flux. So, 
So no, I do, and, I, and I don't get, I don't have a clear idea of what he as a person was like. What I am interested in, as in that um, panel we had this morning, is the work and the fact that I thought it was just totally extraordinary that he could think outside of the box and ask questions um, such as he did ask and, and portray, uh, you're talking about um, the, the, the woman looking back at a male artist. I'm interested because you would not have had a female poet writing in the circumstances in which, and operating as a court poet, you wouldn't have had it. But you had a male poet who was able to look into a female consciousness in ways that were not being done by others. That was extraordinary. And you know, in the, the essay you read for us, um, you showed how, I mean, I, I've read Grounds for Tenure and love the book, and but somehow even you know, knowing what your, your sort of scholarly tendencies are, I didn't pick up the Chaucer influence. It makes me curious. I wonder if you can tell us if in any of your previous novels, whether there was a kind of a, a sly, almost sort of secret line of influence running through. Has, has Chaucer influenced your, your other books or are there other authors from, from that period, from Old English, from Middle English, who you've, who have shaped the way you've, you've written your fiction? I, I would say not directly, but I can't say not indirectly. I mean, I, I, I love the uh, the shifting of voices that you get in the Canterbury Tales, each voice debating and undermining, each, each person undermining themselves, each, you know, tales within tales, and the various tales speaking back to the frame, and, and, and um, that is something that interests me and that I, I like to do myself. Um, but I know I wouldn't say so. I think I know in this, in Grounds, I was really very interested in Chaucer and the Partner's Tale. It doesn't run throughout, and there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence anywhere, but um, I wouldn't say that it was um, that I did that in any other book that I know of, though perhaps who knows what I was doing subconsciously. Who knows what, what, who knows what we do when we're doing, but we don't know what we're doing. Anyway, <laughs> Anu, so what is it about Kafka? You didn't give any... No, that's okay. I'm, I'm jumping around. I'm, we're, not, we're not doing things. We're, we're, not, we're not observing any kind of particular sort of geographic, spatial In symmetry or anything. Times. No, no, I'm, gonna, okay. I'm asking you now. What is it? You didn't, you didn't give us much. You, you gave us a, an intro to letters from Kay, but you didn't explain like the, the Kafka obsession. Tell us a little bit. Obsession is such an ugly word. Um, <laughs> I like to think of it as a sort of prolonged um, and as all, all inevitably, uh, uh, unrequited crush, um, <laughs> which, which is really where I, where I find myself with him. Um, I also found that uh, it was incredibly convenient that he was not alive, um, because then there's, there's no one to, to write back and, and say, well, you've got this all wrong. Uh, you don't understand my work at all. You don't understand me. You have no reason to believe I'd have any time for you at all. Safely dead, I have, I, I have the, the great luxury of imagining that he'd actually want to, um, to, to, to read these letters. Um, and it gives me the space to, to write them. Um, as part of what you're asking also, the, how the letters came? What I'm kind of asking you is, the letters are not signed, the letters to care are not signed by Anu Lakan or by A.L. But I want to know to what extent are these your letters or are these the letters of a character? And I want to know about you personally as Anu Lakan, not a fictional character. I want to know about your obsession with Kafka. I've known you too long and I've known about this, this obsession for too long for me not to put you on the spot and ask you to talk about it a bit. And that's fair enough. And I can answer very honestly if Anu Lakan was writing letters to Kafka they would be very different and highly inappropriate. I would not be reading them in public and I would not be reading them in this space. Um, in part because of, yes, my obsession, but also the level of rejection I would have got from him because he was just not good with relationships, uh, uh, women generally, um, or men for that matter, just to clear that up. Um, so that, I think I needed to follow him in, in a way, um, I'm not a Kafka scholar. The, the world of Kafka scholarship is very, very tight. I don't speak German, um, and that's the first locked door for me, and I was told that very early, that until I learn to speak German, I will never, ever be a Kafka scholar. I will not go to the conferences. I will not 
even get the papers that are produced after. I am low on the list. So how could I follow this person who genuinely makes me feel less alone? And that was through fiction. Um, so that's me. Um, JL is not me. She's a lot braver than me and clearly a, a lot more delicate than I am. She observes the niceties and she's horrified by just the, just the bluntness and the brutality of, of the world, of social media, of, of being too familiar with everyone. Um, and she really wants that time or that person um, with whom she can have quite a civilized kind of courtship. Um, and, and Kafka is that for, for her um, because he's such an un unimaginably remote person and yet in personal relationships, well, he's capable of giving absolutely nothing and he was engaged three or four times, twice to the same woman. Um, he demanded that they write to him all the time. So I thought, well, if I'm gonna be, if JL is gonna be a, a, a fiance, then she's she got to pop to write it up. To him she all has the to time. write to him all the time. Okay, now I'm jumping to Shivani. Shivani, I'm imagining that a teenage self of yours who wrote the poems over and over and over again in a notebook. And I wonder if you can, what's the term? Is it warg? Warg yourself back into, what is it? Yeah. Game of Thrones? I'm not a Game of Thrones fan. What's the term? Like, if you can, if you can warg yourself back into your teenage self, tell us what it is about, uh, what is it about Garcia Lorca's poetry that made you want to not just read it, but physically reproduce it in your own hand over and over again. I mean, I would start by saying that those notebooks are full of some really strange shit. <laughs> and this is probably one of the few things I can talk about openly that's in there. And those will hopefully never find their way into a bookus archive. Um, Listen, don't let Alison Donnell hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Alison looks way too excited. <laughs> it's interesting what you said about Locker feeling like a remote archetype to me. I never thought so. It could be because he was a queer man who was deeply conflicted and didn't have a happy time with his own queerness. Uh, as far as I know, I was talking about this with Ariel just before our session, I don't know that he did any truly heinous shit. And if he did, please don't tell me. <laughs> I, just, I don't want to know, at least until after the festival. Then send me an email and I can try to make peace with it. Um, Lorca was a romantic, I think, in ways that carried a tremendous amount of depth and subversion. And I, I've always been a very disobedient person in private because I've been, I think I've tasked myself with performing all kinds of public goodness I didn't believe in because I believed that it was good to be dutiful and obedient. And I suppose that made my private life of writing and loving the writing of others that much more dangerous and maybe toxic, if I'm really honest. But, but Lorca was never that for me. He was a way to say, maybe if we lived in the same time, we would hang out at the same terrible gay club and drink like two for one drinks and talk about how shitty men are and how you can't get women to commit and like learn how to give good head. I don't know, I feel like we would have been those kind of friends. <laughs> Is, if we've got any, if anyone in the audience would like a question, to ask a question uh, of one or all of the writers, now is your, your chance. We're, I'm looking at the clock and we've, we're running out of time, but I want to make sure if there are any burning questions in the audience, you can ask them. The one thing you're not allowed to do is tell Shivani anything terrible that Garcia Lorca ever did. <laughs> Any questions? I'm looking for hands. Yes? No? Yes? No? This is your last chance. All right. Um, I have been thinking about this, and I'll, I'll ask this one, and maybe, maybe I have time for just one last question before we wrap. I've been thinking about um, something that, of all people, T.S. Eliot wrote in an essay many years ago, um, Another Dead White Man. Um, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just paraphrasing. Uh, he said something like, um, he was talking about literary tradition. And you know, he was a man who was very concerned with the canon, with tradition, with how one poet formed another, who inherited what from what, and all of that. And he said something along the lines of, uh, tradition is not inherited, but earned. And I guess what he meant is, just because you were 
um, just because you're English, it doesn't mean that your literary tradition is English literature. That that may be what the, the context of, of your language or your 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 culture or your nation or whatever. But the the, the tradition that really influences you and shapes you. Uh, sometimes it's something that you have to choose and you have to work at, that it's not a, a simple act of inheritance. And I wondered if any of you or all of you have any thoughts about that idea. If I may, um, it, I think it's very pertinent when it comes to Chaucer because people continuously refer to him, I'm not saying they shouldn't and do anything they like, refer to him as the father of English literature. The trouble with that is it fixes him as sort of the person who spawned the canon, when really and truly to me, what he did was to resist the earlier canons, and out of that, something else followed. Um, and I think people have a way of viewing, as, viewing people as traditional. I mean, when, we, when your students are talking about post-colonial literature very, and counter-discursive literature, often they don't want to read anything in the 19th century or the 18th century, because that's traditional. But you know, if you haven't understood the discourse that you're countering, or, or, or what post-colonial is resisting. If you don't see that people like Wordsworth or Bronte or the others were themselves very radical in their time, doing something that, um, that you know, Thomas Hardy had to stop writing. Um, or felt he had to stop writing after um, Jude the Obscure and so on and so forth because of um, people's reactions. Um, a lot of our concept of what is traditional is very distorting when it comes to the position and what, what that, the actual people were doing. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, this question of tradition is something that comes up a lot when I talk to people about Kafka, because usually when you start talking about Kafka, all you get in response is a very blank, dead sort of look. Uh, why? And why would you want to talk to me about that? Um, and it's very simple. I. Uh, Nicholas said at the start that the elephant in the room is that there are four women sitting here who've all drawn as their inspiration uh, dead white men. I think the other elephant is that we're all Caribbean women and there's not a jot of Caribbean influence here seemingly. To me, Kafka is very Caribbean and quite specifically very Trinidadian. And if you've ever had to go to the Ministry of Legal Affairs, you'll know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, so, when I say that Kafka makes me feel less alone, it's not just a kind of soft, oh, it would be so sweet to be able to sit down and talk to him about all the beautiful things. It's actually that he understands our impossible spaces much better than we do. And he understood them a lot longer than we've had to, to reckon with it. Of all the things people thought he foreshadowed, this is what he foreshadowed. He foreshadowed every ministry and public service office I've ever been in, every high school and, second, and, and primary school and the University of the West Indies. <laughs> right. On, on that note, part of, part of my job at the festival is to keep things running on schedule. And just because I'm sitting on stage doesn't mean I can give that job up. The clock is chiming. The session is over. I would like you to please give a round of applause to the four writers. And our next event in this room, we hopefully will start in less than five minutes. So please stick around.